Welcome to today's episode of uh, Posting with Dave. I am here with uh, the lovely and talented Lynn Chen. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Let's have one more applause. For wow! Thank you so much. <laughs> Broadcasting live from Taro Goto's apartment on Reno Street here in sunny Los Angeles. And how perfect it worked here on Reno Street. And I just got back from Reno the other day. Well, that's more than I can say for myself. I haven't been to Reno in years, but here I am making a movie called The Man from Reno, and <laughs> there's nothing from Reno in it except for the composer. He's from Reno. Um, before, uh, so there's lots to talk about today. I'm I'm in the middle of listening to Lynn's reading of Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan, which is a, a really awesome audiobook that I hope all of you will check out. And uh, we're going to be talking about a lot uh, about, about that a lot today. But I also want to give a quick shout out to everybody who's uh, backed the Kickstarter to finish Man from Reno in the past 24 hours. I don't know if you can hear that police helicopter going overhead. Um, but uh, we're at 42% and, and one week to go. So head on over to Kickstarter and check out Man from Reno. Um, so how you doing? I'm good. I feel I feel like we haven't seen each other in a, in a little while. How long has it been? It, it, not not like terribly long, but yeah, it's around the shoot. More than a month. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, around the shoot. Didn't I see you after that? Yeah, we got together like right after the shoot. As soon as the shoot wrapped, I think we got together and had lunch or something. But then so much has happened since then. I remember you telling me that you had booked an audiobook gig and that it was coming out in June and July and I should definitely check it out. I was like, cool, what's it called? And you were like, Crazy Rich Asians. I was like, wow. Uh, yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> and uh, boy, I got to say, it is a really addictive, smart, interesting it is. book. It is a very well-written book. It's, uh, I think it's officially a national bestseller mm -hmm. right now. And... They're going to make it into a movie. That's what I hear. Which hopefully they'll let me audition for. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I would hope so. I would hope so, too. I'm really curious, because the, the whole world of audiobooks is, for, first of all, i, I got to say that I'm a huge audiobook guy just because I drive so much. So I'm whenever I'm on the road, I'm always listening to audiobooks. So I've, I've listened to a ton of them. But I don't know anything about what goes into you know the actual making of it like how, how did you how did you get involved in this um a few well it's funny a few years ago a friend of a friend a family friend wrote a children's book and i went to go see her um her signing of it and at the signing she had her reader there reading a few excerpts from the book and afterwards i went up to the reader and told her i really enjoyed her performance and she said you know you should do this too you have a good voice and you're an actor and you should just see and i said great so this is three years ago, mind you. She mm -hmm. gave me the contact info. I talked to Random House. They were like, come in, read a few things, and we'll keep you in our file. Three years ago, right? Three years ago. Three years ago. Okay. Didn't hear from them for three years. Suddenly, randomly, I get a call from them saying, can you do a Singaporean accent? And uh, I was like, of course I can. <laughs> and then immediately went home and Googled Singaporean accents, <laughs> and put myself on tape reading the best I thought I could do for a Singaporean accent. And um, then I got a call, like, the next day saying that I was hired. And when I talked to Kevin, the writer, the author, he said that he had listened to a whole bunch of um, voice samples and that the difference between mine and everyone else was that I was acting out the part, whereas everyone else was just sort of reading it. And I didn't know what I was doing, so it didn't matter. But it was funny because my very first day, I show up at Random House um, at their uh, at their offices, where they? Woodland Hills, and um, my very first day because this this book has a lot more accents than normal, and because they were yeah. so specific, it wasn't just like Singaporean accent. It was like Singaporean accent, born and bred in Hong Kong, upper. To middle class, you know, like, <laughs> like it was very specific. So they hired a dialect coach for the very first time. So my whole first day was actually spent going over words because there were also a lot of um, 
words in Singaporean, Malay, and like all these other languages that I wasn't exactly sure how to pronounce. And so she had to, you know, we had to go through that. So the whole first day was spent doing that. And then we tried to record a little bit. And I remember the director, they have a director who's also the sound person. Mm -hmm. um, and she was like, please go home and listen to, and she gave me a whole list of like the Da Vinci Code and like all these people who like <laughs> make these best-selling audio books. And she was like, there's a, there's a certain cadence that goes along, and she said, you're, you're rushing a little bit. You're almost like, I was acting a little too much. Mm. And she was like, there's something you have to do in between to calm down the reader, because right now I'm feeling very rushed by your performance. And so I did, and the next day I came and I read, and when we read, she was like, most improved. <laughs> so Wow, so there's, okay. so there's a director who's also basically the recording engineer? Somebody. Right, right. Well, there's someone who ends up editing it later on. Like, we'd, go, we'd come in and at Random House, they'd have the studios booked. And mind you, there are other people like Joy Asmonsky who do this, who just do it from home. They do everything themselves. Wow. Um, that's sometimes the case. I didn't but, know that. But um, for this particular book, I think they, because it was my first book, and also because of, they told me, like, this is probably one of the hardest projects we've ever done just because of the amount of characters and the yeah. amount of voices. They booked me for more extra time. And for me, since it was my first audiobook, I was really like, great. <laughs> like, everything else would be a piece of cake after this, right? Yeah, I was going to say, and just in the prologue alone, I think I, I counted six or seven different accents, including several varieties of British accents, yeah. um, you know, Singaporean, Hong Kong accents, all of which you pulled off very, very well. Thank you, Dave Boyle. Like, I just, you know, for the first, for maybe the first paragraph or so, I was thinking, wow, I'm listening to Lynn read an audiobook, and then after that I was just like, I was just listening to a story and getting really into it. So, no, it was, it was really impressive. So how many days did you show up at Random House and sit in the studio to record this uh, 13, 14-hour book? I think it was, um, I think we had five days scheduled. Five days. Or five or six days, and then I came in for another day just to do, um, to fix mistakes. Okay. Um, I mean, for the most part, let me make it very clear. There was not one paragraph I got through without stumbling or without my stomach making noise or without like, a frog in my throat or without like saying a word wrong. I mean, like it was literally, I would read a sentence and she'd be like, le boutin. <laughs> and I'd be like, what did I say? And she'd be like, just say it. And I learned after a while how to just keep going, you know, and just go back and not, and correct myself as the days went on. Wow. So you'll probably also hear you know, because we read it in order from the mm -hmm. beginning of the book, <laughs> like my 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 accent gets a little stronger probably by the end because I'm more used to doing it, or that like oh, the the words are flowing a little bit more because it ha probably has to be edited less. Right. Because definitely in the beginning, it's an adjustment sitting there in a chair still for you know five hours, and we would take breaks every hour, hour and a half, and depending on how my voice was doing, you know, she'd be like, let's end now. We conquer 100 pages, let's like yeah. call it a day. Because it was like a little bit of a ride to get out there and a little bit of a ride to get back, so it was a long day. That seems like, um, I mean, if, if I had to venture a guess, I would have thought that it would be like two weeks in the studio, but five days is... Well, that's usually like, that's a lot more than they usually do. I think a book usually takes about three or four days. Really? So wow. for me, that was like, for, they were all like treating this so, so how, how do you, I mean, obviously for this book in particular with all the different accents, there is the dialect coach and some, a certain amount of research on, on your part, but I, I mean, I can't imagine that you'd really be able to, are, are you reading some of that stuff for the first time as you're reading it? No, recording? no, no I, I read, I've read it for the probably third time okay. was when I was sitting there reading it. But that said, you know, it was funny because I've done a lot of voice work before and uh -huh. Um, this was unlike anything else because it was a situation where I would read it and be like, I'm not happy with that read, and they're like, keep reading, you know, like, <laughs> we don't care if you're, if you don't feel like you're emotionally getting there, um, unless it was a really, really important scene, 
Right. Um, for the most part, there was really no going back. It was just keep reading. And there was like some sort of like, it was a bit of like a meditative experience after a while. It was sort of like, because initially in the beginning I wasn't familiar with all the characters yet, so before mm -hmm. we started I'd be like, hold on, and going through all the, the chapter and seeing who was coming up and yeah. making notes and like, this is where I do this. But then I learned like, oh, when I get to that part, I can just take two seconds figure out whose voice that is, and then do it. Like, I don't have to rush right. right into it and, like, be totally prepared beforehand because they'll just edit it to make it sound. Get used to that. Yeah. Some people are just now tuning in and they ask what book or what you guys are talking about. Okay, so if you're just now tuning in, we are talking about Lin Chen's audiobook recording of Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan, and it's uh, it's currently a national bestseller, and it was also just op optioned for a, a movie as well. And we're talking about the process of making an audiobook, which as an avid audiobook reader, I've always been fascinated by but never really known anything about. So speaking of, um, so you mentioned that you, you had a conversation with Kevin Kwan after you got the, the gig. Did you have any further involvement in, in the audiobook thing, or was it pretty much just a... Well, we, before we started, you know, we had a very long conversation about the book and about the characters and what he wanted, but he pretty much stayed clear of it mm -hmm. from then on and until, like, the book was done. And then we were just having conversations like, congrats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that was basically <laughs> it. Um, I have yet to meet him. I think he's going to be doing an L.A. book tour soon, so hopefully I'll be meeting him at that point. But he's like a total foodie. Which you'll see if you read the hear or or read if you read, look at the book or hear the book. Uh, there's a lot of food stuff in it, and I have a food blog, so he and I bond more over that stuff. Over that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how how would you come, in terms of the overall exhaustion level or exertion level? How did it feel at the end of one of these audiobook days as opposed to like a day on on the set of a movie? Oh, it's a lot less. Crazy, but yeah, I, I was not as exhausted. But that said, I was really paranoid about my voice. Uh, you know, like I was yeah. really afraid that um, I was afraid to talk. You know, after yeah, after drink that, a lot of tea and lemon. Like I'd come, I'd come home and just not. I think there was like two nights that there were karaoke things, and I was <laughs> like, oh, I have to stay home and not do that. Yeah, I used to I used to read about John Leguizamo when he does his one man shows on. Broadway that he would literally not speak for the entire day before he goes on stage. You know, wow. like he'd meet people and just have to be like, you know, not actually say anything. But I can see how reading a hundred pages out loud might give you concerns about your about your voice. Yeah. Yeah. What was your What was your out of all the different accents that you had to do? What was your personal favorite? And what was the one that you dreaded the most? I hate, well, I can tell you which one I hated right away. Um, the Australian accent because I <laughs> it'd be like I thought I had it and then suddenly I'd be saying it and then I'd get like in my head about it and then everything came out as just like a southern accent Ooh. like an American yeah and then I couldn't stop and I'd be like hold on and then I'd sit there and and think of like because I listened to a bunch of um, dialect training and mm -hmm. for Aussie they'd be like think think chew chew chew. <laughs> So I'd be sitting there being like, chew, chew. Really? That's the word? That yeah. Word? Yeah. You chew your words. Chew your words. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, um, and then I'd say it, but then I'd be like, <laughs> I can't even do it now because I'm on the spot. But then it would come out as like, a, I'd sound like Paula Dean. Oh, no. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to go there. <laughs> um, but uh, it was not. And then you know that was that was that was only a few pages. So the whole time I'm sitting there, like you know, like oh my god, I hope she's not going to stop and be like, you are not sounding Australian at all whatsoever. Uh, there were only a few characters, but I really got into the Singaporean woman. You seem to be enjoying yourself. It was really fun because they have attitude. Mm -hmm. It's like almost I we we compared. It's almost like a slightly there's an. There's a hint of like an Indian accent in there, but like with like like my my dialect coach Lydia, she kept saying she was like she was Singaporean and she was like, do you know what chill means? It means to 
Can I curse? Uh, go by all means. means. To have sex in a very passionate manner. And she was like, and that's the way you have to talk uh, with every single time. Like, that's how you have to use this. Like, Singaporeans, they pound, they pound. And she was like, you cannot be timid. And actually, I have a lot of trouble with the Mandarin accent because mm. it's what I grew up hearing. And to hear, but you have to read every single word that's written, and for me, Mandarin accents are cutting out um, verbs and adjectives and uh, prepositions and all other right. sorts of things, and and you know changing plurals to you know, but you can't do that. You can't do that right, right, with yeah. the audio, but like every word has to be as written. So um, I could not you know replace L's with R's or R's with L's or anything like that, or add S's where there were no essence to be found. So it was really difficult for me. Huh. Um, so how did you get around that? Just, I just, just suck it up? I just sucked it up and did a really <laughs> bad version of it, basically. But at that point, I was sort of like, I'm in this bar. What are they going to do? They're going to fire me? <laughs> They're not well, going to fire me? They're not going to fire me for this one? i, I got to say, it sounded, it sounded perfectly good to me, but <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> If you're just now tuning in, I'm talking with Lin Chen, who has starred in many films, including Saving Face and uh, uh, Wine on Rice and Surrogate Valentine and Did I Save You? All his movies. <laughs> <laughs> we worked we worked together now so many times that you know it's just it's uh, we we've. we I, I don't really know what to say. We've worked together so many times. It's it's a lovely it's a lovely place to be. Yeah. The um, Dave Boyle crew. Which leads into this tongue and cheek, tongue and cheek question. Okay, how we got a tongue and cheek question. How long have you had a crush on Lynn? How long have I had a Who's crush on Lynn? Who's tongue and cheek? I don't know. <laughs> mm, six, seven years, I guess. Yeah, since he first met me. <laughs> no, it's um, no working working with you and on every film that we worked on so far. It's it's funny how I think the first time that we worked together, I don't. I don't think I really talked to you all that much. No. Yeah. We were yeah. like in, we were you were on your directing side, I was on my acting side. And then we were on location. Right. So it was like in Salt Lake City, Utah. It was like when we weren't talking, I was either vacationing or <laughs> recovering. Right, exactly. So I, I remember when we shot that scene in uh White on Rice when uh when Hiroshi comes to pick you up from school and he ends yes. up having a break into the car. Yes. Um, was it was a like a day. it was a difficult day. It was about 108 degrees, and at one point I actually thought that I had killed you because <laughs> it, you were suffering from heat stroke and you had to like lay down and have a cold compress on your head and everything. And um, I'm sort of ashamed of it now, but looking back, I was like, my first reaction was just to like. Just to like wait until everything I was like, and then I thought to myself, no, "What perfect. are you doing? Go, go talk to her and say like, you know, see how she's doing." So I walked up to her, I was like, uh, "Lynn, are are you uh, are you doing okay?" And you smiled and you're you're like, "Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm okay. I'm so sorry about that." And I and I was astonished that you that you were apologizing when I was. I I felt bad that I was like holding a production, I was, but I just recently learned that on. On Little Miss Sunshine, when they were shooting in the car, that they had to like have like bags of ice on their laps. Yeah. So maybe in the future we'll have just no. Well, we couldn't have done that for <laughs> anyway. Yeah. You know, it was all. It's all good. It's all good. It was. Funny. I get heat stroke. It happens. <laughs> it's funny. It's like you know, I, I I think even like the gaffer was like, dude, what are you doing? There's a man down on your set. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. So was, That wasn't as scary as the bees. You remember the bees? I do remember the bees, <laughs> and I want to take this opportunity to publicly apologize to you about the bees. That was really funny, though. So Lynn's, um, I, I almost said addicted to bees, but you're allergic to bees, not I am. addicted. I am. I'm a very delicate flower. <laughs> I, I, I wilt in the sun, and I'm allergic to bees. And uh, so... There was a there was a scene where she and Hiroshi are sitting on a park bench in White on Rice, and um, right before we were about to start, we discovered that underneath the bench there was a beehive, just 
hanging there, and uh, Lynn was like, hey, I'm allergic to bees. Oh, I think we had already shot it on that vet. We had, like, done, like, the wide shot already. Oh, right. That's why we couldn't right. move. Right. That's right. Oh, okay. Well, then I feel a lot better now, because in my memory, I was, like, <laughs> no, was crazy fine. pirate director, and I was like, you're going to be fine. We, we must. <laughs> no, you took a lot of precautions. I just felt bad for that PA who had to be, like, sitting there with, like, a can of wasp spray, yeah. and every time she saw, like, an inkling of movement in the bee beehive, she'd be like, bee! And I'd go, like, running off, and she right. would go in and spray the beehive, but I was like, what if she gets stung? One of the producers on that movie, Dwayne Anderson, who's one of my best friends, is a little bit like Inspector Gadget in that he often seems to have unexpected things in his coat pockets or whatever, <laughs> but um, the bee problem came up, and then within two seconds, he was walking over with a big can of wasp spray or bee spray or whatever it was. We're like, where did you, where did you get that? Because we were shooting out in the middle of nowhere at that dinosaur park. Yeah. Um, but that was so. That was our first experience working together. And then I went away, edited the, edited the movie, and then I didn't really see you again until like a year and a half later when you and Abe came up for the world premiere in San Francisco. And then that was 2009. And then 2010, we made Surrogate Valentine together, which was sort of like, um, that was like, you know, I, I wasn't even sure if you were going to be down to do that because I was like, hey, look, we're making this for basically nothing. It's going to be mostly non-actors, but I, I feel like I really need some, some great actors as well. Do you want to do this? And you were like, yeah, send me the script. And then that was... Uh, that was like like totally guerrilla style. Well, for me, you know, after I saw White on Rice, it was like a, it was a moment for me where I was like, oh, this is, I, I just really liked your style, and I was impressed with what you had put out. Thank you. And so there was a part of me that was like, I'll, and I still feel this way to this day of like, I'll do anything to you. You know, like a, yes. you don't even have to send me a script. <laughs> just like this is because I there's like an amount of trust there at that point. Usually, yes, after you wrap a project, you don't end up talking for quite a while because right. you don't know what's going to end up happening, but the experience for me, even with the bees and the heat stroke, was so positive, and the result I found to be so fulfilling that it was sort of like a no-brainer. And I had so much fun making both Surrogate Valentine and Daylight Savings that at this point, it's sort of like, I just want to always be a part of the stuff that you're doing. Which is why, like, even with Man from Reno, even though I had nothing to do with it, I was, like, showing <laughs> up on set, you know? No, you, well, you, you were a big morale booster for, uh, for all of us on Man from Reno. Lynn actually made us a Man from Vino cake, which, uh, I gotta tell you, was, was pretty delicious. Good, I'm glad. Vino makes everything taste very moist. That's what that's Where, what where did you get does. that recipe? It's like a southern recipe. Mm. You know, an Australian southern recipe. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's like cake mix, pudding mix, wine, butter, that's... soaked in more wine and butter. Gla wow. That's glazed on top. It'll keep for months, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it actually did. We were, we were, everybody, the crew was eating it little by little for over the period of like the last two weeks of production. It was, <laughs> it was impressive. Um, so, uh, what were we talking about before we were we talking went about on a trip down memory lane? We were, um, you, you mean even before Why Not? We were talking about Why Not Race? Oh, we're, we were, we're talking, talking about, about the audio. We were talking, we were about, talking audio, about audio books. Audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so five days in the studio with the director slash audio engineer barking orders at you, and then... When it came out, did you listen to the whole thing from beginning to end? I still haven't really listen to it. Um, they gave, they sent me a copy, uh, which was a surprise because I didn't think I was going to even get one. I mean, it's wow. really like, there's <laughs> there's no there's no glamour or glitz to any of this, including the payment. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not glamour and glitz. Do they, give you uh, some, do they give you some water while you're working? Yes, on? they do. Actually, there's plenty of water okay. and um, peanut butter Keebler, uh, Keebler uh, crackers 
Oh, cool. Lots of lots of those. Those can got to be sustained. That's good. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I didn't even think I was gonna get a, a copy. I thought I was gonna have to go out and, and get <laughs> my wow. own. Yeah. And then suddenly one appeared on my doorstep, and I was like, awesome. But it's it's it was so great. The first time I heard about this book was from you telling me about the audiobook, and now all of a sudden it's all over the news. You know, it's been optioned for a. Or a, a big movie. It's a bestseller. Um, a lot of people are comparing it to Downton Abbey, which um, you know I, I I never really got into Downton Abbey, but I I, I see the comparison, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the sense that it's like there's a lot of intrigue and there's a lot of characters that while you don't necessarily you can't necessarily like it, it, it simultaneously like satirizes the characters as but you can't help be sort of sucked into yeah all the, the little you know, ins and outs of the relationships in the story. Um, but that's, I mean, so, so the, the movie. Yeah, we'll see what ends up happening with the movie, what they end up doing with it. Man, I have a, a feeling I won't have any part to do with it, but uh, I'm really, I'd be really happy to see an all-Asian cast in a super movie. I yeah, as soon as it was announced, I was seeing a lot of lamenting on the internet of, you know, the pe people were... Uh, sort of predicting that they'd find some way to, I don't know, alter the, the source material in some way. To make I it think work. Kevin is pretty, I mean, I don't know this for sure, just in like the brief conversations I've had with him, I think he's pretty, because he wants this to be a trilogy, mm. you know, like um, he's not, I don't think he's willing to sell out in that way. Like sure. I think he wants it to stay true to the book. I feel like the book has enough material in it to make a trilogy of movies, though. I mean, just because yeah. it's so... It's, uh, There's a lot that, that happens, but also it's so specific. Like, I don't think that... Um, I don't think that... They couldn't you make could, Rachel yeah, into, like, You a, couldn't make Rachel, because it's, it's, it's about her being Chinese-American and right. still not being enough, and you couldn't make anyone else not. Like, there's... I, I can't think of one character that you would be able to change... I mean, they wanted to do the same thing with Saving Face back in the day. Oh, they did? Yeah, they I wanted to make it way. for with, like, Reese Witherspoon and Ellen Burstyn. Or at least make my character white. Like, they were Thank like, you. why does she have to be Asian? <laughs> she could be, like, some Kira Knightley or someone, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've had those conversations, too. Um, like, when I was trying to get financing for White on Rice, one financier suggested, like, what if, what if you made it into a Latino family? And... Uh, by that point, I had already cast Hiroshi in the lead role, and I was like, well, I kind of want to make it with, with Hiroshi, and then it wouldn't really make sense if, you know, he was living with a Latino family. Right. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, fingers crossed it'll be a, it'll be a great movie when it, when it comes out. But I'm, I'm personally, I, I'm deep in, into it right now, and uh, if you haven't checked it out, it's available on iTunes and also on CD. Um, so we're at the halfway point. I just want to, if anybody's just now tuning in, I'm talking with Lin Chen, my frequent frequent collaborator and and uh, and friend. And I've also been talking about the Kickstarter campaign to finish Man from Reno, which is my current uh, which is my current film. And if I seem a little bit loopy today, it's just because I was I was up all night editing Man from Reno. But you know, it's it's uh, I'm really happy with how it's going. But you can see some footage down on our Kickstarter page if you go to Kickstarter and look up Man from Reno. Can we talk a little bit about Man from Reno? Or I don't know yeah, which, let's, which, what let's, direction you're, you're trying to go in right now. No, let's, um, let's talk about it. I, well, I, I'm curious about what it, what it was like for you to... Uh, to working on, <laughs> like, I'm interviewing you. This is not, this is not this what is not happens, right? That's, that's totally well, I'm just curious because I know so many people who are involved with it. Yeah. So I'm like, that's I'm true. just curious about how, how it went. Like, how was working with Rich as a cinematographer? Because um, he directed you. We can talk about that. Rich, Rich directed me, yeah. I, I, I came in and did uh, two days on, on Rich's movie, Yes, We're Open, which is also available online, and which stars Lynn, and we had one, one scene together. We, we had, no, we had two scenes. Two scenes. Two, both of my scenes were with you. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, so that so that was our our fourth project that we worked on together, um, and that was it, it was 
actually working with Rich as a as a director was really educational for me because I, I hadn't been in front of the cameras in years uh, ever, ever since my very first movie where I played the lead role by myself and um, just watching I, I, I'd say that uh, you know Rich is the kind of guy where the set is his natural habitat you know like he he's um, he's fully comfortable on, on, on a set and, and, uh, and leading a, a big group of people. Whereas for me, I'm the opposite. Like my natural habitat is the, uh, the editing room or where I'm writing or something like that. It, it takes a lot of energy for me to like be out in, in you know, basically ma making decisions in public and, and being in front of a lot of people. It's, it's taken me a couple of movies to sort of feel like comfortable. That surprises me. But, uh, well, good. But watching, watching Rich work was actually really educational for my own process, just watching the way that he brought things, brought things out of people and, and the way that he would make decisions, the way that he would... Um, I felt like I, I learned a lot. And then immediately after I worked with you guys on, on Yes, We're Open, then I went into directing Daylight Savings, which was also... Um, which was really like a, an attempt by me to kind of push myself into different territory, things that I'd never done before. But now Man From Reno is like totally uh, new territory in a lot of ways. Like it's, it's a new genre. And, um, and also I was working with Rich again. This time he was my cinematographer. And uh, that was, it, it, I, I had a, an awesome time working with him. Like it, it was really, really great. And he, um, the thing that I, uh, Especially, well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was one scene that he and I discussed for about 15 minutes, months before we were shooting it, and we never talked about it again. And then when it finally got into, when we were there, he had already, he, he already knew what we were doing. He, he had, like, every shot already in his head. He's able to keep so much information, like, shot to shot to sh you know, keeping what what we're doing, like what the what the story is, what we're trying to accomplish with each shot, in his head at any given time. Like he's just um, he thinks really cinematically, and and uh, and I feel like his strengths really kind of make up for a lot of my weaknesses mm -hmm. as a as a director. So it was a really good collaboration that way. Like he's a um, so yeah yeah I don't know. Do you stop by? On the day that we were doing the, uh, we had a lot of extras. We had a lot of extras. Yeah. It was like a, a book signing or something or something. Book signing. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that was my worst day. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because, like, that was that was the day during the shoot. Every every shoot, there always comes a day where I feel like I hit a wall, you know. Uh -huh. And then I, I, I get back into it, and the next day everything's back to normal. But that day with like 60 extras on set was the day where I felt like I'd kind of hit a wall. And um, but you know we we made it through. We got everything that we needed. You brought by a man from Vino Cake. From Vino Cake. And yeah. and that made the day. So no, it was it was a it was a really um, part part of the reason why uh, this movie was a challenge was because. We were trying to do something that was so big scale, at the, a budget that was not even half of what we had on White on Rice. Um, Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Because and it's not like on White on Rice we were every day going just like rolling in money and and stuff like that. There was, it never feels like there's enough money or, or enough time. Like on on White on Rice, nobody really got no, nobody got paid a, an, an extravagant amount, but um, but. It, at least you know, at least people were getting paid something. Whereas on this one, it was really like uh, I I really had to rely on the generosity of people believing in the project, and luckily they did. Um, and uh, you, just just to be able to get through like the day to day needs. Um, so it was. I mean, it was a challenge in terms of like the, just the scale of the economics, so to speak. But uh, you know, I was really proud of. What everybody was able to pull off, but we're wow, we just lost like five viewers. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
but we're uh, you know we're getting closer and closer to the finish line. So check it out on Kickstarter, and I hope you like what you see. And there goes one more beer. But enough about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do people want to see? What do people want to talk about if they're leaving? They're, they're, well, I guess they're gone, so it's too late. Yeah. There, too any, late any more questions on, on the comments forum? No, just comments. Just comments? I'd love to win. Oh, that's Aww. nice. Love back. Love back. Yeah, I you know. have a question for Lynn. Okay, yes. go for it. Suggestions in LA for like filmmakers on a budget. Where some good eating? Oh, food places places. For, food places for filmmakers on a budget. Um, what kind, okay, so how low is it, how low are we going? Are we going like hole hole in the wall? Like yeah, let's go. Okay, hole let's in the wall. go hole in the wall. I need to access a list. <laughs> um, well, uh, but on the secret, the secrets. I mean, like any place in Koreatown. I feel like every time I go to Koreatown, I eat enough to last me a week, just from the the amount of meat I end up consuming. You know, what's really good was that place Fung Mao Mutton Kebab that we went to. Oh, I wouldn't right. say that's like super duper cheap, but that place the, by the CGP? many 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 portions. Um, yeah, the place by C the CGV Cinemas. It's a Korean slash Chinese uh, kebab place. Mm. That's their specialty is kebab. Um, if you're like me and you like and you like a good uh, you know sandwich, I, I, I'd say the best place in LA is I Panini di Ambra. But I don't. I'm, I'm, I know that place. Did I on Sunset? It's on Hollywood. On Hollywood? Yeah. yeah. I, um, I've been there just for the pizza. With Randall Park. That place is pretty awesome, right? It is good. It is very good. Sweet couple uh, who panini. runs it. Good. I haven't tried the panini. I only tried the, um, the, pizza. the pizza part. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is, I'm like, let me go through my list. <laughs> um, I mean, I really like... Um, okay, let's see. Sorry, this is so not. Well, you could talk about what she's looking about where we're eating next week. Yeah, well, while, while, while Lynn comes up with some good suggestions for, for places to eat in L.A., um, I want to tell you a little bit about our Kickstarter countdown party next week on Tuesday at, uh, at Flying Pig downtown in, in L.A., which is... Unlimited tacos. For anybody who is back in the project... You're invited, and it's going to be unlimited tacos. And I got to tell you, their tacos are, are pretty awesome. So, um, Asian, fusion. A Asian fusion tacos. Thank you, thank you. Um, and also, there's <laughs> uh, what else we got going on? There. You're, you're, you're going to show some clips. We're going to loop some clips. We're going to show. Us, we're going to show some clips there. Um, it's a, a lot of the cast and crew is going to be there, so you can come and say hi. Um, I'll take every backer is invited, so check it out on Kickstarter, and I hope to see you in person at Flying Pig next Tuesday night. Is Lincoln? Wait, next invited. Tuesday night, I will put it on my calendar. But you know, Flying Pig actually. <laughs> put her on the spot. <laughs> I haven't checked my my calendar yet, but I will put it on. Um, Flying Pig actually sent me in my mail by my fan mailbox a um, a great. Like publicity thing, they invited me in for a for a meal, and they sent me a, a pig nose and a flying pig, and I thought it was ingenious, and I tweeted about it, and I emailed them, and I was like, "This is awesome. When can I come in?" Nothing. Nothing. They have not responded to me. Oh, well, flying pig. I want to. Maybe I'll show up with. They had a changeover. Oh, okay. And they also are opening a new location. Yes, the fig and set at fig and seventh one is the one who who emailed me. Oh, um, yeah. I'm going to share, I, I mean, anyone who reads my blog is not um, surprised by, by this, but my favorite number one place to go is Scoops, which is Scoops. only is only <laughs> gelato. Ooh, but it's geez. so awesome because it's so cheap, it's so good, 
they have different flavors every single day, like crazy flavors. Like uh, I think they once had a foie gras flavor wow. that caused a lot of problems with the vegans. But they also have amazing soy gelato. Uh, it's on Heliotrope right by Melrose. There's actually one on Highland Park now that they franchise and another one in um, near uh, on the west side. I don't remember exactly where. On Overland, maybe. Wow. Um, Scoops. Scoops is my hands-down favorite number one place to go. I go almost twice a week. Um, really great. And it's very, as I said, very cheap. And, you know, it's not, it's not like you hang out there all day or anything. Um, that sounds you go like and you get ice cream and you go. That's basically it. Or gelato. Well, and, and I know where I'm going uh, as soon as I'm done going over to Kickstarter and, and leaving a pledge for Man from Reno. Well, actually, I can't do that because I... It's my own project, but you can't. You can't. No. You yeah. can't back your own project. <laughs> did you see my mullet challenge? Yeah. Uh, did, oh, did I, I it didn't see a mullet? Well, yeah. I think I think the thing was I got the idea for the mullet challenge at like two in the morning on Saturday night. I was like, I'll get it. I'll, I'll I'll like put this out on Facebook, and then um, if by Monday night, you know, if we reach a certain level, then I'll cut my hair into a mullet. Um, but. I, I think that it needed a little bit more time to you grow. You needed people. So what, what do you think, guys? Do you think I should bring back the mullet challenge and let it let let it uh, simmer a little longer? Let me know what you think in the comments forum. And if if more than one person thinks it's a good idea, then the mullet challenge is coming back. I, I would like to see you in a mullet. I actually think that I do quite well sporting a mullet. Well, after you, after you announce it, though, and within minutes, some people pledge. Yeah, that, that's true. But it, but it was a it was but but still, I was getting messages from people last night who had didn't hear about it until after the deadline had already passed, and they were like, "Oh." You needed to be like the grand one of the grand finales. Yeah. You need to be in a diaper with a bullet eating scoops ice cream. I'm not I'm afraid. I guess I Narrating crazy rotations. That's actually yeah. <laughs> that should be your challenge. I'll, I'll live stream your audiobook of <laughs> Crazy Rich Asians while I'm naked except for a diaper and eating scoops ice cream and getting a haircut. That's, <laughs> that, that's over. The I know. I, I well, you know, well, I just, what do you think of the diaper thing? I guess it must have been from Chad Stoops wearing a diaper and in, in, in Surrogate Valentine. Yeah. How Where did you get that giant diaper? Uh, you know, I don't. I don't remember. I think I just got on on eBay and looked up giant baby costumes. Because okay, Sergey Valentine, which was our <laughs> second film together, was an interesting experience because there was no art department, there's no like locations department, there was no costume department or anything like that, and so uh, wardrobe was basically me and Lynn talking about what do you think of this? Yeah, looks great. And I also I. I I felt bad about this in retrospect, but I totally reversed. I think, like, at first I told you, let's go no patterns, all dark yes. colors. But then I talked to Bill Otto, the cinematographer. He's like, dude, what are you doing, man? In black and white, she's just going to blend into, like, all the, all the background. Like, patterns are going to be the only thing that gives you any sort of separation so that it stands out. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. And so I, I called you, and you were like, oh, good thing I just bought a bunch of solid... Uh, dark color <laughs> outfits for the movie, and I was like, oh, man. But then everything I ended up wearing was, like, all stripes. But then what happened was it was so cold yeah. in San Francisco <laughs> that I ended up wearing my coat the entire movie. Yeah. I think me and that black coat with a scarf was, like, my ended up being my coat, which is basically what I wear every single day. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So no, it, was... it was me and Go playing ourselves. <laughs> exactly. So Mike Aki wanted to remind you about the truck. The truck. Oh yeah. Ooh. Oh, have you been what's, to the no, truck? what's the truck? Oh man. What's the truck, Mike? When you've never been to the truck. Oh, the truck is that place you wanted me yeah. to meet you at once, correct? The best meal. Yeah. It's the, it's the just place the truck. that I wanted. Yeah. Well, it's called La Isla Bonita. Oh, I've heard of La Isla Bonita. It is <sighs> amazing. It yeah. is so good. It is so good, and the tacos are like a buck fifty. That's good. It, Wait, how do you spell it? I gotta, I gotta La Isla Bonita. So I believe it's on, it's on the corner of like, it's in Venice. 
and I know how to, I, I know how to get there from muscle memory, but I don't actually remember the cross streets. My my kid is up with the cross streets in the. Uh, Lays La Bonita. Um, yeah. HP asks, Lynn, how do you feel there. about Scoop's brown bread ice cream? Oh, yes. So br br brown bread ice cream is what Scoop's is known for. It's sort of like gelato with a ribbon of of um, grape nuts cereal. <laughs> you know how grape nuts taste really good if you <laughs> heat it up and add sugar or maple yeah, syrup? Yeah. This is what it's like. It's kind of amazing. Okay, well, I... I you you sold me. Everybody who's in the LA area, I, I sell their day. I'm gonna That's be at it. Scoop sometime between 1:30 and 2:30. So and I'll probably be there for a long time because I'm gonna have more than one flavor of ice cream. So it's next to there. a it's next to a bike. Oh, it's next to a it's next to a bike shop, um, so you can get bikes bikes fixed. And it's also near a uh, college. LA Community College, I feel like. Oh, but maybe okay. not. Uh, there are students often there. A lot of people that hang out at Scoops. It's small. Scoops. It's not really a. Co I don't know if you'll be hanging out there too long. Mm. Most of the time, I go and I eat in my car. Oh, okay. To All be right. quite honest, so right. maybe you I'm, won't be. I'm not going to be hanging out there. Never mind. <laughs> I mean, I still go, but uh, I mean, if I see you, I see you. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so where where can we? What's coming up next? Um, what is coming up next? Yeah, I just, yeah, I just wrapped a movie with Time Ma that um, was directed by Tiffany Hsu. Uh, she is was a member. She finished just finished uh, the 2013 program of the AFI uh, Women's Direct. I don't know what it's called. AFI Women's Directing something fellowship yeah, yeah, program. Uh, I think, uh, I don't um, so this was her project, and I did that with her very recently. So that will. Uh, appear at some point. Uh, but I'm actually currently shopping for managers and agents, which is not fun. Mm. It's like dating. It's like uh, like I have one date this week, and I have two dates next week, and I have three dates the following week, and wow. who knows? Like, I mean, it's great to have dates, but yeah. like you don't know. Like, what if like you have this one date, but what if like the date by the third week is like amazing, but what if the third week date isn't great and the first week date was the person and they're like, why'd you wait three weeks? Right, yeah. I wasn't good enough, you know? That's, uh, that's, that's a tough say. one. Good. Plus I googled one of them beforehand and he was on a list that was not a favorable list. Oh no. <laughs> so I'm a nice. little nervous. I mean like that is just more like curiosity more than anything else of like to see what this person is like in person. Mm. What if that person ends up being my agent? That's mm. weird. It is. It's like it's like dating. It's like dating. I, not that I would know. I've never dated. <laughs> 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 I've been with my husband for 16 years and we never dated. <laughs> so it's what I imagine dating to be like. Yeah, I, 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 I hear. I watch a lot of Sex in the City. This is like dating. This is this is like so. What's the equivalent of like somebody who? Uh, ah, never mind. <laughs> I think we. we, we I've already we, had a few bad dating. dates where like we both show up and we're, we're like immediately we just know this is not going to work. And so like the whole time we're like talking about all the projects we'll work on together, nodding like this, and then <laughs> being like, "Great, I'll call you. It's wonderful." And then, That's why I've always yeah. liked those. I've always enjoyed those. Uh, industry events that are basically where you just have like five minutes to talk to the person and then you move on to the next table. Those, oh, have you ever been to any of those? I've never been to an industry event, but I've heard of that with speed dating. You can do that with industry events? Yeah, they, they have like them. Like pitch meetings? Pitch meetings. There's um, like, I, I, I went to this thing called IFP No Borders a couple years ago. And yeah, it, and it's basically an international co-production market where um, you have there's like a bunch of different film financiers or production companies or, or whatever who might be interested in your films. And then when you apply to get into the program, then you basically, like each day of the program, you have 10 minute meetings scheduled where you just go from table to table and meet with each of the, wow. each of the people. And it's, and it's nice because if, if it seems like there's something happening there, if you're, if you're feeling the chemistry and you feel like, hey, you know, why don't we go out to, I mean, the, the showbiz equivalent of, why don't we go out to dinner, which might just be like talking a little bit more about the project than you've gone, but if it's clear that neither of you really have anything to 
to say to each other or to work on together, then you know it's only it's over in ten minutes. You can talk about the Yankees game or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I've 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 never been as many viewers can probably tell. I I've never been very good at small talk. It's just not my. I just I just can't do it. You know, if I don't have anything to say, then I don't say anything. And if I say something that sounds like, uh, well, I don't know. That's not true. What do you mean? I don't think that's true. Because I saw a different side of you, a small talky side, a jokester <laughs> side of you when we were shooting Yes, We're Open. I was like, who is this guy? Who is Dame Boyle? Because you walked onto that set as without having the responsibility. Oh, and yeah. then you were like a totally different person. I, know the answer. I think. Because Rich was there. When you and Rich are together. Yeah, well, you, when 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 I when I worked with you guys on Yes We're Open, first of all, like I I was I was there for two two days and maybe part of one more day, and so I could just I I, I didn't have to like you know I didn't have to worry about like keeping I, what, what, what's the word I didn't I feel like I had to like worry about making a good impression on anybody <laughs> 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 I could just come in and goof off you know and. And, and just have fun with it. So like before every take, I'd be like, "All right, guys, hands in. All right, let's do this thing." <laughs> you know, the kind of thing that if I had been on set for all uh, 16 days or whatever it was for the shoot, everybody would have been like, "Oh, Dave, shut up, man." <laughs> I don't think that's that's sort of so interesting because whenever I go onto a set as like a day player or in a very you know just like one or two days, I'm always like much more quiet. Really? Mm-hmm. I, I feel like... Because I'm like, I don't want to, like, you know, like, like people have things set up. I don't want to rock the boat. I, I, wanna, I feel like, like, I got one day to burn all these bridges, <laughs> and I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, so, I don't know. It's like when when uh, when you're the director, there's there's so many things to think about and so much responding. You know, you, you want to make sure that people don't lose their trust in you or anything. You, you, so... You, I, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of extra reserved just because I'm trying to save all my energy for when I need it, and I'm, you know, trying to watch and make sure that everything goes on the, the way it's supposed to. But um, when I was just coming in and day playing, I was like, party time! You know? <laughs> so, I mean, I had like maybe four lines in that in that movie. Yes, maybe but you stole every scene. No, I, I, it's the truth. Even the Q and A's we do. You answer one question, and everyone's like, afterwards, for like months afterwards, they're like, that Dave Boyle. <laughs> well, it's it's the it's the kind of part. H.P. Mendoza wrote the the perfect kind of part that any actor would want to play, and that's the guy who only has a couple of scenes, who doesn't really even have to read the script. If if well, if, well like of, of, of course, you know, re responsibility demands that you do it, but you. Everybody is talking about you for the rest of the movie, you know, on and off. They mention you and everything, but you're really only in it for a few, a few brief moments. Right. And and he he wrote a part that was very easy to make a, a big impression in. I guess is is what I'm trying to say. So it was, I, I think, um, you know, the the way that HP wrote it and the way that Rich like set it all up, it it was. The, the perfect thing for me to be able to walk into and just goof off for a couple of days and have it turn out fun. So. Do you think part of it was also that we were on location, that you felt in vacation mode uh, a little bit? Yeah, and part of it was probably because I was... because um, I, dro I drove from Utah to San Francisco the night before we shot it, so I was a little bit... I was, like, a little bit crazy from... Doing like a 14-hour drive and then arriving and then sleeping for a couple hours and then showing up on set. So it was just loopy. Yeah, yeah. But no, that was that was so much fun. You, despite my um, my demeanor on set, I, I still like learned a lot in that whole process. Watching, it's 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 always interesting as a director to to shadow another director and watch how they work. And when it's somebody who's a, a really talented director. Like Rich, then I feel like it was, you know, an invaluable education, especially for somebody like me who, on my first movie, I was basically, like, 
I don't know. I went from being PA and security guard to director. <laughs> I never had and like star. <laughs> and star. <laughs> I, I, I never, you know, I never really paid my dues doing, um, you know, a, a, a sort of below the line job that uh, that had any kind of responsibility besides watching to make sure the camera didn't get stolen. So, so for me, I for somebody who's been making it up as they went along this entire time to suddenly be on a set that was run by somebody who really knew what they were doing and also really knows like how a set is supposed to be run and how it's supposed to go. That for me was, um, you know, that was totally, that was worth, it was basically like going to film school. Right. So, yeah. We have a new backer. We have a new backer. Calvin Reader. Whoa. Hey, Calvin. Calvin Reader, Calvin thank you so much. I love the name Calvin. Calvin Reader is uh, is a great filmmaker. He directed this awesome short called The Rambler, which uh, premiered at Sundance a few years ago, and then he directed a feature called The Oregonian, which is which is um, which is crazy. So it it has to be seen Oregon? to be believed. It takes place in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, it's it's one of those movies. Both both of his features, he did The Oregonian and The Rambler. They're best just seen not knowing anything about them. Um, and I actually I tried to get him to play the mustache guy that Dwayne played in Daylight Savings. No. Oh. So, uh, but it, it didn't work out. But Dwayne Dwayne ended up stepping into that role. But thank you so much, Calvin. Appreciate the play. So I guess we're uh, we're about to wrap things up here with with Lin Chen. It was great to have you on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so Crazy Rich Asians. Get on iTunes. Uh, get get your copy if it makes for a great listen. Um, and especially if if you're like me and you take a lot of long road trips, you're you're gonna need all the entertainment that you can get. And she is she really delivers in this one. So be sure to check it out. And um, for everybody who's watching, please, um, if if you don't mind, I, I'd love it if you could share the Kickstarter link on. Facebook and Twitter today. We're we're just a week out, and we're about uh, we're 42 percent of the way there. So uh, we're hoping to get a last minute surge here and and get Man from Reno finished. I mo I would like it at pretty low back end levels. You know, from from 25 dollars and up, you'll get to see the movie. You'll get to um, stream it online, and every backer, even from one dollar, is invited to our our countdown party next Tuesday night at Flying Pig, which we're also live streaming. And if you're available to, to come to LA, or if you're in LA, um, you know, it's unlimited Asian tacos, so come check it out. I keep doing the, the thumbs up thing, which I feel like is like the default awkward guy thing that you do when you're not quite sure if what you're saying is really... Uh, no one's made a mullet comment. Nobody's made a mullet comment. I guess. I guess the no, mullet challenge is you and a mullet, or what about a mullet and a diaper? Well, yeah. I, I got an email from Michael Tully this morning. It's like, hey, dude, I'm uh, I've been out of the loop. Uh, so what happened? Do you have a mullet? Like, did you make the goal? And I was like, no. And I was like, I was th I'm thinking about bringing it back because I feel like I didn't give it enough time. He's like, dude, you're you're acting all disappointed, but I think people actually don't. They're doing you a favor. They don't want you to have to get a mullet. <laughs> so I guess I guess for that. Oh uh, wait, there's some questions. Oh, there's there's some questions. Let's let's answer a couple questions before we go. Hi, Lynn. Um, what blogging platform did you use for um, actors that who decided? Uh, I use WordPress, and I had moved from. Blogger to WordPress.com, which was a free one, and then I moved to WordPress.org, which is not free. And when I made that switch about a year ago or two years ago, I hired a professional. His name is uh, his 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 blog consulting company is Zesty Blog Consulting, I think it's called. Zesty. Zesty. His name is not Zesty. His name is Corey. He's Canadian. But his blog company is called Zesty Blog Consulting, and that's who did it. Who did everything for me because it was it was a lot to move over like three years of blogging over to one thing. We still got one minute left in the broadcast. Are there any final questions from our lovely audience? Questions from HP. You want to say hi to HP? HP. Hi HP. He thinks he was quiet during this for open two. He didn't remember. <laughs> he wasn't quiet. 
He was fun. I don't know if he and I were ever on set on the same day. I think he would. I think he was. He had to have been there on the. No, because he was doing. Um, he was just making the he song. Was making, he was. No, he was. He was also in pre-production for I Am the Ghost. That's right. Which That's is an right. amazing movie. Everyone should see it. But you've had him on before, so I'm sure you plugged yeah. in the. H. H. P. Mendoza is uh, easily one of the most talented people I know, and so. Thanks and for, a fellow foodie. And a fellow foodie. That's right. You have a 24-hour telephone, so we can I have a, I have a 24-hour telephone coming up this weekend from 3 p.m. Saturday to 3 p.m. Sunday. I'm going to be live broadcasting my every move as we count down towards uh, countdown to destiny. Um, so I hope you'll join in for that. And That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like that. I'm, I'm putting together a, a, a list of guests and... And we'll have lots of fun activities, and who knows? Maybe I'll get, I'll give myself a mullet on the air. Um, Hebron is back. And Hebron. thanks so much, Hebron, 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 for our being becoming the latest backer of Man from Reno. We really appreciate it. All right, thanks so much, guys.